uh, I'll give you a little bio information about Sergeant Major Remington right now. Uh, Man Sergeant Major Remington is married to his wife Lisa and has three, three children, his son Kevin Jr., Corey, and Scott. Uh, he joined the Army in 1982 and was initially part of an island uh, invasion force to the island of Grenada. Uh, he's worked extensively in Central and South America with the Army Green Berets. Um, since then, he had joined the National Guard, North Dakota National Guard, being the first sergeant of Border Patrol operations and of the 957 uh, multi Role Bridge Company, which is my unit in Iraq. He is currently assigned to Joint Force Headquarters, North Dakota National Guard, as a Command Sergeant Major. Uh, numerous Special Forces uh, classes, um, United States Army Sergeant Majors Academy, um, Jump master course, military free fall parachute course. Uh, decorations and awards are include but not limited to a special forces tab, master parachutist badge, combat medic badge, army achievement medal five times, army commendation medal four times, bronze star and the silver star. And here's a little CNN clip about Sergeant Major. In Heroes tonight, the incredible story of Sergeant Kevin Remington. Now he put his own life on the line to save the lives of his fellow soldiers in Iraq and earned a silver star for his bravery. Casey Wyan has the story. Kevin Remington's been in the military for more than 20 years. Last July, his training was put to the test in Iraq. Delivering supplies to a river patrol, Remington's convoy was bombed. The blast severely injured two soldiers, trapping them in their truck. After that, a full-scale firefight erupted. You have a window of opportunity where you either do something or you do nothing, um, or you get paralyzed by the the thought process. Rather than leave the area, Remington made a tough call, ordering his machine gunners to keep up the fight so he could rescue the soldiers who'd been hit. I uh, just told him to hold tight, you know, that, that we were going to get him out of there, just, just hang in there. With bullets flying, Remington got the severely injured soldiers out of the vehicle and out of the so-called kill zone. Although he put the lives of other soldiers at risk, Remington says he has no regrets. If soldiers don't have the confidence that they're going to be, somebody's going to come back for them, um, they may not fight as hard. The driver of the vehicle died of his injuries, but the actions of Remington and his fellow soldiers saved the life of Specialist Brandon Erickson. He cares about his troops just amazingly. He's just, he's the epitome of an NCO. He's, he's a great guy. It's, I was, I was so glad, glad he was over there with us. The military has honored Remington with a silver star for gallantry, but he is humble. When I look at what happened that day, I look at it this way. Over the years, um, the United States military has put a lot of time and a lot of money into Kevin Remington. And my hope is that day maybe I gave a little bit of that back. Remington will stay in the National Guard for three more years. Casey Wyan, CNN, reporting. In next week's Heroes, we'll have more of the remarkable story of Specialist Brandon Erickson. Thank you. Are we hot? All right. I, I really appreciate that, and I will accept that warm reception on behalf of all the folks um, that have served, are serving, and continue to serve today over there. Uh, regardless of what you know, your, your feelings may be about current events, um, I think you've got to take your hat off to those folks that, that go and do a job that, that they're asked to do and, and do it to the best of their abilities. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, this morning, or yeah, we're still morning. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try to lay out uh, some, some basic um, leadership, I don't want to say philosophies, but uh, maybe give you some tools to put in your toolkit, whether you've been a leader for many years or uh, whether you're just now approaching a leadership position. There is no silver bullet out there. There's no one size fits all. People are different. When you're dealing with people, you got dynamics. You got to deal with different things, motivate different people. You get in different situations. Um, but what I am going to try to do is I, I'm going to try and lay out just some basic fundamentals 
for you to think about. What you take away from this presentation is going to depend entirely on you. Uh, my, my hope is that if you give me 30 minutes of your attention, that I will, what I will give back to you is something that you can take away from the presentation and use sometime further down the road. I stand before you today making no claim to have all the answers, okay? Because there's just too many situations, there's too many different things out there. The things I'm going to talk about are not military specific. I think if you take time to process what I'm going to tell you today and what I'm going to talk about, you'll see that it comes down to basic human decency. And you'll probably identify, yeah, I've worked for somebody like that before. And on the positive end, yep, I've worked for somebody like that before. And I got a lot I'm going to try to get through in 30 minutes, so hang on. People deserve best leadership you can provide. Real quick before we get into talking about crisis leadership specifically, I want to point out that there is a difference between management and leadership. Resources are managed. People are led. While it's true that people are a resource, okay, and, and that resource can be managed, that's true only from the perspective of how many people would you put against or what type of skill sets that your people have would you put against a given task in your organization. That's management. What motivates those people to do the best that they can and to be as good as they possibly can is the leadership that you will provide for them. There's been a lot written about leadership over the years. <clears throat> and again, not standing up here before you as some self-proclaimed expert on it. But what I will say is a lot of it has been written by people who have studied leadership extensively and quite possibly not been in that leadership position, don't have the experience to put with that, or it delves into an individual's leadership philosophy that they sat around and thought about for years and years and years uh, because they quite possibly didn't have anything better to do. What I'm going to tell you is both of these have merit, but it comes back to basics, it comes back to fundamentals, just as athletic competition or anything else that you do in life. When I talk about the fundamentals and the basics, as I go through, you're, you're going to see that we can draw up these, these really complicated things that no one really understands. And we're so much better off if we just get a set of principles that we guide ourselves by. And then it always gives us some place to come back to when things get confusing or we get in a crisis situation. Formal and informal leaders are needed for success. It's not about everybody that's just in that leadership position. It's not the leader doesn't make things happen, OK? They kind of guide things. But you need people that step forward. These are the people that, um, that take initiative to make things happen for you in your organization. And again, these, these are not military-specific concepts. These apply to the educational world. And I, I can go there. Both my parents are educators. Um, it, it applies in, in corporate America, and it does apply in the military. And I'm going to talk real quickly uh, about just some informal leadership, some examples of that. And this goes to speak to why people deserve the best possible leadership that you can provide. John Fettig, um, as previously stated, was killed that day. Um, John volunteered to go over, didn't have to go. Uh, John had just come off a convoy. Uh, because of the amount of equipment I was taking on that convoy that day, I went to him and said, hey, need a bigger vehicle. You got a vehicle, need you to pack back up. He was thinking he had a couple days, you know, basically to regroup. Uh, I didn't give him that. No problem, top, whatever you need. Okay, uh, When people see things like that, the people next to them, the next time they get asked to do something that's maybe a little extra, they reflect back on that action of that other individual, their peer group who was in an informal leadership role in that situation, and they hopefully will do the same thing. So these informal leaders are really important. Ken Hendrickson was killed along with Keith Smitty. There may be some folks in here that, that knew Keith Smitty. Keith Smitty was a student here at NDSU. I'll come back to Kenny just for a minute. Uh, Kenny worked in the Bismarck Public School System. He wasn't a math teacher, but he was the kind of guy that you would find out in the hallway helping kids with their math in between classes. Okay, that's just the kind of guy he was. He actually used his class Did he? Welcome. Glad you came here. That was the type of guy that Kenny was. Okay, he he would help you out whatever you needed. Okay, now. Keith Smetty was part of the Big Brother program down here okay, in Fargo and helped folks out. Um, that day, when those guys were in Aramadi, there was a mission for one vehicle to go to Fallujah. 
Kenny said, you only need one vehicle, I will go. Keith looked around and said, well, I'm the next in charge. If you only need one vehicle, I'm not going to put my people out there. I will go. And so those two individuals chose to take that mission. Neither one of them would have had to. They could have elected not to do that. And this, again, is why I say, you know, people do a lot of things that we maybe don't recognize and we don't think about for us every day, even back here. And that's why people deserve the best possible leadership that we can provide. Leaders are made, not born. Uh, you know, we think of these born leaders. It's true some people have more charisma than others, you know. They have the, the ability to make friends and influence people quite naturally. But I submit to you that it's the things that you learn that will provide you the strength of your leadership more so than it will what your God-given attributes are. In November of 2003, uh, after the ambush and prior to John and Kenny being killed in January, I did an interview over there, and I just want to uh, throw this up for you guys as food for thought is the second sentence here that says you must be willing to learn. Obviously, I can see from your patches, you know, you've been involved in other operations B before, Tom. So how, was that important? Was that a good learning experience, what you went through this stage in your military career? Um, was that a good learning experience for you for where you're at now? Um, yeah, definitely any, any experience that you bring to the table is good, but uh, I'm learning right along with the rest of these folks. Uh, you know, having been on, on several different deployments, um, everyone is different. And there's there's new new challenges. There's new things to be to be learned, uh, new lessons to be learned. Uh, but hopefully, and again, that's probably better asked of, of the soldiers whether some of those things that I have brought to the table have been beneficial or not. They they would be the best ones to answer that. But I certainly hope so. Point here: If you go through this quote from Frederick the Great, it talks about the mule carrying. You know, and you go through all this. Well, what what does this all mean? Basically what he's saying is that just the fact that that mule went on those 10 campaigns, the fact that they had that experience of being there does not in of itself make them better at the art of war. And he goes on to say that basically, okay, that's because it's a mule and that's okay, but what's really sad is in, in what is many times considered an otherwise honorable profession, you've got a lot of people that go through all those experiences and don't learn from them, okay? So it's the willingness to learn. It's not the experience by itself. And I'm gonna talk about people in leadership positions versus true leaders here in just a moment. But it goes way beyond that. Okay, we get to the meat of the subject of what I wanna to talk to you about today. True leadership's gotta be character driven and you need to lay that foundation, that base. You cannot expect that all of a sudden when you have a crisis situation, whether it's in a business setting or, or family setting or whatever the setting is, that if you have not laid that foundation for people to have confidence in you, that they're just gonna automatically react. You have to lay a foundation. And then I'm gonna talk real briefly about how I believe that applies to those of you. True leadership is based on character. It's gotta be character based because that's what you're gonna go back to. That's what's gonna drive you. When, when things start getting really crazy on you, you're gonna go back to what you really believe in. Well, unless you've stopped and thought about what you believe in, what, what you really carry inside of you, you're not gonna have any base to go back to. So you need, this is something you need to give some thought to. What are those things that are truly important to me and what do I believe in? And your character can be developed. It's not something that you just either happen upon or you don't. You identify weaknesses in your character, and you work to improve on those. I'm gonna give you what I believe to be the three fundamentals of character-driven leadership. First one is courage. Now, when I talk about courage, I don't want you to think of always a physical danger type of courage. I'm talking about moral courage, okay? And it crosses over into the physical. I'm talking about moral courage to do the right thing. You can see up there three times a verb from, removed from the Latin word. It's the Latin word core, meaning heart. So you have heart. You got to have heart if you're going to be courageous. I can't stress this enough. Integrity is a foundation for trust. You've got to be honest with people. And on top of all that, you've got to have the desire. 
If you look at these three things, these are things that you can all work on within yourself to make yourself a better leader. We'll go in a little bit of detail. You can see here, no decision is going to be liked by all. It's no different than if you're making a decision with a bunch of friends to go do whatever activity. There's always some discussion about how you should get there, how long you should stay, what you should do when you get there, et cetera, et cetera. It happens even in, in small familial groups that not everybody's going to agree. Well, accept the fact when you're in a leadership position that not everyone's going to like every decision you make. In fact, probably no decision you make is going to be liked by everybody. And that's where you go back to your character. You go back to your base. You make decisions based off of that. And then you're good to go. Do the right thing when no one's looking, because a lot of times, when you think no one's looking, someone is. Okay? And that's when you truly know you've got it, is when you will do the right thing when no one's looking. You'll do what you would have done had you been directly supervised. Therefore, people will start to trust you also. And this is whether you're in leadership or, or you're, uh, you're one of the subordinates. Risk, again, it doesn't have to always equate to physical bodily harm risk that I'm talking about. It might be one of you people that works for you has a recommendation and you feel that the leadership is not going to be receptive to that recommendation, but you feel it's a good recommendation. Do you tell them to just go for, yeah, go ahead and take that on up there and you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, okay? Or do you accept some professional risk and go along with them and say, I believe in what this person is proposing here and I believe it's a good idea. Accepting that same level of risk of not being accepted by, by the upper echelon leadership in your organization. And it goes into the physical again, it does cross back over there, but I want, I would, I want to make sure that you're not thinking just in these small terms. Uh, we, we talk about the ambush that day and, and it serves as somewhat of a case study for some of these points, uh, but the purpose here is not to equate this all to military operations. Discipline equitably those you like and dislike, sometimes that's a tough go, okay? Uh, because we, we like people, but you, you have to. Encourage an integrity to tell people the real deal. Again, we'll get back to that integrity. So much of that is based off of that. We have courage. I've talked a little bit about character-based leadership and, and how, you know, being brave, if, if you force yourself uh, to do the right thing even when you're, you have some concerns. That will strengthen your character. It will make you a stronger leader. Courage being one of those. These are all related. Here's the problem we have is when we throw in fear. Now here's what I'm going to tell you about fear. Fear is natural. Fear is not bad. Do not feel guilty. Do not ever feel guilty because you sense fear. It means you have a brain. Your body is saying, this is not a good situation. I have some apprehension about this, okay? It's what you do with that fear that counts. Do you overcome that fear, or does that fear overcome you? And you may have such a physical response to that fear with the adrenaline and everything else that, <laughs> you know, it's going to be more difficult. We're all different. We're different people. We respond to different stimuli, okay? But I don't want you to feel that you can't go forward because you're sensing this fear. Don't let that hold you up. Overcome it. Now we hear a lot of terms that are used. We talk in courage. We're talking, uh, you know, we hear the term heroics. I'm not even sure I know what that word means anymore, to be honest with you, uh, because of some proper usage, some improper usage. I feel. But what I can tell you is people can demonstrate heart, okay? And that heart goes back to what do they believe in? What, what's inside of them? I got another clip from that video, and I want you to think about these people's situation, first time they'd ever been in anything like that, and what those guys went through and the heart that they demonstrated. One thing really sticks in my head, you said four uh, times you went back in. There's uh, some heroics there with uh, Brandon Erickson, I'm assuming he uh, needed immediate care. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, it, as far as what happened there, the, um, you know, the, the, the term her hero heroics, it's, it's very subjective. Uh, but what did happen is uh, 
Brandon, um, Brandon was on the passenger side, and that's the side that, that got hit. Um, as they exited the vehicle on special fitting side, uh, the guys in the gun jeep took off, provide cover fire, went around to the other side, couldn't get the door open. Uh, just talked to Specialist Erickson real quick, uh, came back around the other side, um, pulled Specialist Fetig out. Specialist Erickson was already crawling across and I encouraged him to come across. Um, and then as he was extracted, um, he was taken up in a, uh, actually a, was a Josh Schultz specialist, Josh Schultz, one of our combat lifesavers that, uh, I don't remember if it was a wrench or what, but used something to, to use an improvised tourniquet that, that certainly, you know, saved his life from, from blood loss. Um, so again, it goes back to all those those training things that you never know who the person is going to be that's going to need to use it. And, uh, you know, on, on that side of it, um, you know, certainly could have lost two that day, and I'm, I'm grateful that we didn't, and that's because of one soldier's, well, several soldiers' actions, but that, that incident in itself, you know, and uh, just need to, you know, point out those guys that they went back, there was four of them that went in and out of that, that kill zone four times and took fire every time. Uh, I just can't say enough about those guys uh, asking them to do that with them never having had a shot fired at them in their life. Uh, they didn't hesitate. So those those are the guys along with, with Schultz that, you know, definitely if there's heroes to be had on that day, it would definitely be those guys. For the, for the record, do you know their names? Sure, certainly. Um, it was uh, Sergeant Shane Lenick. Uh, was the driver of the vehicle. Uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Ron Watson was in the back, and then the two guys with the uh, squad automatic weapons were uh, Specialist Travis Katiter and Specialist Ernest Wool. Um, and those two in particular, um, I mean, they all were there. They all went through it. Uh, they were the ones that provided the heavy volume of fire. Uh, that allowed me to do some of the movement that I did uh, in, uh, you know, to protect the, the vehicle itself. Uh, Sergeant Lenick, he had no options. He had to drive, so he couldn't even occupy himself with returning fire. His, his job was to drive through there and hope nothing worse happened to that vehicle. And, uh, and he did that very, very bravely. So, you know, all, all four of those guys, I uh, just take my hat off to them. They're, they're the best. That's the heart I was talking about, and that's what I think drove those guys to do what they did that day. Again, we talk about integrity. You can have integrity through speech, okay? You gotta be able to look people in the eye and tell them the honest answer, even when it's not what they're gonna wanna hear. And we've probably all been in those situations before. And we've all been told things we really didn't want to hear. But most people will be able to accept the fact that that's what needed to happen. And until you're willing to do that, you are going to struggle because what's going to happen is you're going to try to make everybody happy and you're going to alienate everybody versus being consistent in what you do. On the praise thing, you can never say thank you enough. Someone can say to me, I'm a knothead, I can say thank you, and the next time I thank somebody for something they did, it still has the same meaning. If we take praise and we just throw it out there like we do candy in a parade, Pretty soon it stops to mean anything. So look for opportunities to praise your people as often as you can. Just make sure that it's deserved when you do it. Otherwise, it'll lose its effect. Now, as we talked about, that was through speech. You also earn trust <coughs> through your actions. And you're probably more so this is going to stick with your people. You have to be consistent. Do it, do it. You handle situations the same way in a disciplined sense, each and every time, whether it's someone that you, you know, personally like or, or that you don't. You have to maintain consistency. You can stand up here and talk about leadership philosophies all day, and if you don't walk the walk, and that's what I'm trying to say here, is you need to demonstrate through your activities that those are the core values that you hold as a leader versus just that you read it in a book somewhere and it sounds good and this is all good to go. These are some of the ways that you can demonstrate, and I won't read the laundry list to you. People need to see that you truly are putting their needs ahead of your own. Not their wants, but their needs. 
because wants and needs are two different things. We all want all kinds of stuff, okay? But what we truly need is a smaller package. We need to make sure that we satisfy those needs that our people have. And we try to satisfy as many wants as we possibly can. You see it's a longer laundry list through deeds than it is through speech. So it's more about what you do than what you say. And lastly, you've got to have the desire. Remember, it was, it was courage, integrity, and desire. You've got to work as hard or harder than you're sporting. When you get up to the top, that doesn't mean you sit down. Okay? That means you keep striving hard. You need to be goal-oriented. If you set your people up for success, you will, in turn, set yourself up for success. If you spend your efforts trying to set your people up so they look good and they're successful, you will, in turn, be successful. I just want to go through this real quickly. There are some in leadership positions who are in leadership positions but not true leaders. Many people are true leaders that are in leadership positions, but some have risen there either because they've gone to the requisite training for it or they've been in the organization so long or whatever the case may be. And you have some of these people in leadership positions that will avoid controversy, they try to be popular, your true leaders will make the right decisions based on their character on what's good for the organization. You'll have some in leadership positions will, there's a hot button issue, they'll throw everything at it just so they can look good for whoever their leaders are. The true leader is going to take a long term approach at what's good for your organization and your people and they may not even reap the benefits of that program or that process that they institute. It may come to fruition years down the road after they're gone. But because they have a genuine interest in you and the organization, that's the approach they take. I've talked about risk. To get to spotlighters, that's the one that says, look at me, I have arrived. I suggest you look for opportunities to spotlight the people that work for you, and that in turn will, will come back to your benefit. It gives them a sense of being, a sense of belonging. Okay? They don't, don't sit and relish in the fact that you've arrived at a certain position. Instead, you need to, by virtue of the fact that you've been given that trust with that position, you need to strive every day to prove that you were the right choice to be put in that leadership position. That day, there were no good options. And we could, we could go in through a, a case study of, of different things that happened, uh, human dynamics, and we could spend an afternoon on that. But what I will tell you is that however imperfect my character is, and it is, I, like everyone else, have my character flaws that I work on to, to make better and to improve. But it was what I believed in that I would not leave those people back there. Those, those, those people were not going to come off the hill and get a hold of my guys. They were mine, they were hurt, and I was going to do everything I could to get them out of there. Not me alone, but I was the one making the decisions. The only reason that I believe those other guys is I was, because I left the vehicle fairly early and stayed on scene and told them to go do this, go do that, and they did it, you know, without hesitation. The reason I believe they did that is because they had the trust. I had never lied to them. I had told them a lot of things they didn't want to hear. I made them do a lot of things they didn't want to do, but I had never lied to them. And so they had that trust when it, when it got chaotic. Uh, they had the trust in place to follow what I was telling them. To. We did not have time to have a discussion or a vote. We needed to do things, and we needed to do them now. And there was a shared desire among participants, a belief in a greater cause, the good of the order, taking care of their buddies, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to throw these things up for those of us in leadership positions. When we start looking at our subordinates and saying they're, they're not doing this, they're not doing X, they're not doing Y, just I think we need to ask ourselves these three questions. We got one more quick clip, and we're, we're almost there. I know you guys are up against the clock, and I apologize. But I got one more quick clip that speaks to my belief, and I'm speaking more to the, the student population at this point, my belief in you and people of your age group. And I want to share that clip. It's from that same interview. There'd be a message that you'd want to give back to the moms and dads 
husbands and wives of the soldiers here of what you've seen in the past five or six six months what how how would you describe your your soldiers to those relatives back home well you know, the only thing i would like to say is that uh or the main thing i guess that i would like to point out is i, I think there's been a a generation or a generation and a half that's been sold a little short. You hear about the Mina generation and the Nintendo generation. You hear all these these labels that are put on people, and uh, um, I, I haven't seen that. I, I think it's maybe not enough has been expected or demanded of, of people at times, and uh, you know, therefore they haven't shown what all they're capable of. Uh, we've demanded a lot of these people, and uh, like I said earlier. They've continued to produce. Uh, they've, they've met and exceeded our expectations. And uh, I would have to say in, in every facet of what we've done over here. Um, so I'd just like people to know that there's uh, America's youth is, there's, there's not a major problem with America's youth. Uh, they're, they're strong, good, solid citizens. And, and they're over here making the best of a eh, less than great situation. Uh, no different than the people who have gone before them and done this in other conflicts. Keep in mind that interview was done about three years ago. It's not something that was done recently and that I did this interview is for a part of this presentation. That's what I believed at the time when we were still over there. That's what I still believe today. I still have that sense of confidence. Two slides, we're almost there. This is the tools that I was telling you about. These are things that I would like you to take away. Your leadership has to be character driven because when things get ugly and chaos reigns supreme, you will go back to what your base beliefs are to make your decisions. And it's not going to make all your decisions easy. But at the moment of truth, some clarity will come to you. Again, I had so much information processing at that time. What did I go back to? They're mine, they're hurt, and I'm going to do everything possible to get them out of there. Again, not me alone, but I was the decision maker. I had to go back, I had to put all the clutter away, all the noise, and I had to go back to my core belief system. And that's why I'm encouraging each of you to develop that in yourselves. You can develop your character, you gotta be willing to learn, but leaders are made, not born. And be that true leader, don't just be in a leadership position. This last one, again, speaking more to the students in here, I mean, there's no way around it. The rest of us are getting old and at some point, we're going to pass on or we're just going to move out of these positions. You guys are the leadership. So when you hear these labels, it's noise. Okay, Ignore the noise. Start preparing yourself today. I'm going to give you three quick thoughts on your way out the door. This is like you know, you're going through the drive through at McDonald's. This is what you put in a bag and take with you. The youth of today are like the youth of yesterday in that they will rise to whatever level of excellence we demand of them. So again, I'm a believer in youth. Does that mean you get a free pass? Does that mean your standards are lowered? No. It means I believe you're capable of so much that I'm going to demand this of you instead of shrugging my shoulders and saying, ah, that's just, that's this new generation. Ah. When in charge, be in charge. When you're placed in charge, people are looking to you to make decisions. Be in charge. Don't ask your people to do anything that you haven't done before yourself or you're not really truly willing to do. And keep in mind that the less than perfect decision is better than no decision at all. And you truly are the future of this nation, and I believe this with all my being, that again, talking to the, the students, the younger generation, that nothing good happens in this country without you as a part of it. Do not accept mediocrity in yourselves. Continue to demand excellence of yourselves, and continue to do the best that you possibly can in whatever capacity you're serving. I want to thank you. It's been a great opportunity. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for allowing me to be here today. Oh, I wish all of you Godspeed in your future endeavors. Thank you very much.